Welcome back to film two in our series with Dr. Bupesh Pristi. Here, Dr. Asad Khan and I ask about how autoimmunity fits in with reactivated latent viruses, what role SARS-CoV-2 persistence might play, and how you'd go about trying to treat the complex picture of long COVID. Let's dive in. With respect to the mitochondrial changes, are these reversible potentially, or do we not know? So if the proteins are there for a very long time, so you can imagine those specific cells or tissues where the virus is reactivating, probably it is um, way too much um, for the cells and tissues. There can be possibility of permanent damage or death of the cells, which can cause inflammation and things like that, which will bring us to the autoimmunity part later. But depending on um, how much of these proteins are produced and um, how much they are released into the blood and things like that, the amount of mitochondrial damage uh, to the other cells and tissues will be different and they can be reversed basically by increase and decrease in the protein amounts. Could you just describe a little bit, you mentioned autoimmunity there. What is the link between this reactivation of these sort of latent viruses and autoimmunity? How do the two fit together? Um, the, the classical uh, knowledge, um, we know that um, whenever there is a chronic long-term leaky smoldering viral infection or reactivation, it always comes with autoimmunity. And the reason is that um, when we have these um, cells and tissues which are basically um, reactivating the virus and they are um, killed or destroyed over a period of time, releasing all the dead cellular debris and proteins, or DNA, RNA, and things like that into the um, circulation. We have Pathways, we have proteins uh, which take care of these dead cellular debris and materials so that the body doesn't start detecting them as an um, antigen to produce the antibody. But if somehow we cannot remove or scavenge these apoptotic cells and cell debris and they start accumulating inside our body like what happens in lupus and other autoimmune conditions, then we start developing autoantibodies against these our own antigens. That is what called autoimmunity. So basically, we start developing antibody against single-stranded RNA, double-stranded um, RNA, DNA, and other proteins. The smoldering viral infection, reactivation, cell death, unable to clear the cellular debris lead to autoimmunity. That's the most simplest way I can describe it. Besides this, you have the possibility of some of the viral proteins producing mo uh, molecular mimicry because they are more or less similar to human proteins, and that can also cause autoimmunity. Yeah, So there are two possible ways. With respect to persistence of SARS-CoV-2 itself, um, there is a group of um, researchers and uh, also a segment in the patient community who are very devoted to that idea and think that that is what is going on and that that is the only thing that's driving everything. And that, that is what should be targeted. Now, my view on this has been that we may have viral persistence of SARS-CoV-2, but that doesn't mean that that's causing the illness. There will be some host factors that will determine whether uh, it's playing a role. It may not be so much the viral persistence as the spike persistence, because you do get similar uh, sort of presentations in people who are vaccine injured. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered what your view on SARS-CoV-2 viral resistance itself was? I tend to agree with you that um, so far we do not have any um, convincing evidence of true viral persistence of SARS-CoV-2 in human body. From time to time, we see papers describing uh, detection of viral RNA protein over a period of time after the infection in different tissues and bodies. So if you, being a biochemist, I know that the RNA protein have a very specific life. So first of all, people don't detect the entire functional protein or RNA. You only detect bits of pieces, broken pieces, broken protein and things like that. And the second thing is that, so you don't know whether the protein and RNA have any function. So there is, there is some, some blank space over here. I don't want to completely disregard the persistent hypothesis, but I'm not convinced at this moment. So my argument is that SARS-CoV-2 is the first trigger. It comes in, it does something inside the body. Over a period of time, many changes happen and that a second trigger comes in and that causes the long COVID. This is the second part of our paper. Basically, we saw that definitely it is very clear that the SARS-CoV-2 is the first trigger, but persistence of SARS-CoV-2 is not yet proven and we don't think so. It does something at the level of um, immune modulations and um, we, um, we saw that why SARS-CoV-2 
can cause the autoimmunity and how this autoimmunity can lead to everything else. So that is what our paper is all about, yeah. So if you look at this logically, we've got this issue where the immune system has changed, the, the, as a result, the latent viruses come back to life. That then, you know, subsequently triggers the autoimmunity. If you're going to try and address this and try and interrupt this process and go to the top of the waterfall, waterfall to sort of like block it off, what would be the options? How do you get on top of this kind of localized, you know, latent viral reactivation? In total, if we see the all the herpes viruses, they probably will be, you will find that a majority, almost almost all the long COVID patients have one or other herpes virus being reactivated. It's not possible to see all of them having everything. But when we look into what is causing autoimmunity, it is very clear in our studies, there is a very specific type of changes happening in after the COVID infection. This is black and white, and that is loss of natural IgM. I, I told you that we have three different type of uh, patients in our uh, or individuals in our co uh, cohort. One is no long COVID group, mild long COVID, and severe long COVID groups. So the no long COVID group also has uh, so a major major change in the uh, depletion of natural IgM. Now we have to understand what is natural IgM. I hope you, by now you know it. The natural IgM. These are the type of IgM or natural antibodies. There is also natural IgG. These antibodies are not produced against any antigens. Yeah. So these antibodies are positively selected and we start developing these antibodies in the fetus stage itself. So we do not need any antigen. Now, these antibodies are always there in the healthy population. They, they play a very important role in T cell, B cell differentiation and things like that. But one of the major role of this natural IgM is scavenging, is clearing these apoptotic cells. They bind to C1 and C3 proteins and uh, they uh, does the complement activation and they take these uh, together with the macrophages, they clean these dead cells. And what we see is that um, after the SARS-CoV-2 infection, almost every person who is infected with SARS-CoV-2, they deplete these natural IgM. You know? There's a very small number of people. Uh, for example, I would say around 2% of uh, patients, they actually have a very high amount of natural. They are they're completely different. But 98% of the patients, they deplete this natural IgM. From our data, we see that um, it at least takes around 8 to 12 months time to bounce back from this depletion of natural IgM. The natural IgM amount has a direct correlation with the disease severity. The more severe the long COVID patients are, the more depleted the natural IgM is. We think that this is, this is the key source of autoimmunity. Once you have no way to um, remove or clear the um, cellular debris from your body, which is happening because of SARS-CoV-2, or which is also happening because of the herpes virus reactivation, uh, or any other inflammatory process, um, you are not in a condition to remove these debris, and that leads to development of the autoimmunity. People are going to hear all this and say, okay, so if we've got this problem with these reactivated viruses, even if they're localized, I need to take some antivirals, I need to take some Zoborax, I need to take some whatever. Are those likely to work or do we need to develop or do we need to deal with the problem after that? Do we need to just accept that reactivation and do we actually need to treat the autoimmunity with immune modulating drugs? Like where's, where are the, where's the role here for intervention and, and how does that work? The textbook knowledge about virus reactivation tells that the virus reactivation happens, the virus undergoes uh, replication and then produces new viral particles. And that's why every anti-herpes virus drugs that we have in the market at this moment targets the uh, DNA replication machinery. So what we argue is that it might work in some uh, patients where the viral reactivation is really, really strong. But it will not work against the leaky, the smoldering uh, viral reactivation, because here there is no viral DNA replication happening at all. So here we need something different, something completely out of the box idea, targeting specific proteins, specific RNA molecules, or whatever that may be is causing the problem. Yeah? So we do not have a clear cut answer to, um, to tackle the viral reactivation at this stage. But as I mentioned that there is a possibility of auto recovery here in, so, so virus reactivation, has a role to play, but maybe this is not everything, you know, because the body has always the tendency to push the virus back into the latency also. The smoldering or leaky virus reactivation probably will go away over a period of time if we change the immune conditions 
a better immunity and things like that. But autoimmunity is something which is a one-way traffic. If we don't stop the process of autoimmunity, it will start developing different type of autoantibodies and uh, over a period of time, we accumulate the damage one after the other. So the most essential thing what we we have to target at this moment is to stop the autoimmunity because we know that now from the literature that um, acute COVID infection as well as long COVID has clear signs of autoimmunity. Our study also saw that MECFS has autoimmunity. There is no specific branch of autoimmunity here. We found that it's basically a wide, broad range of uh, autoimmunity happening. And that's probably because all sort of autoantigens are exposed inside our body. Hope you found that interesting. In the next film in the series, we'll be talking about how this picture fits in with the clotting abnormalities found in long COVID and how treating the condition early might affect outcomes. Look after yourselves. Until next time.